Okay, so we're live on Facebook and we've got the recording going. So hello, Makita and hello, Sabina. How are you? Hi, Hi good. good. How are you? Good, good. I'm going to give Facebook a minute or two just to let everybody know that we're here and that we're live and I'm realizing I need to put more lipstick on. I mean, I see your beautiful red lipstick and I'm looking a little washed out here. So. <laughs> <laughs> always something going on here. Um, so while Facebook's notifying everybody that we're live, I'm going to fill a little bit of time here talking about Warwick's. Um, Makita, where are you calling in from? Um, I'm in Wilmington, Delaware at the moment. Okay. But normally you live in Baltimore, is that correct? Yeah. 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 And then Sabina, where are you calling in from? Um, New, York. New York. Queens, New York. Okay. Yeah. So we've got the East Coast covered. Warwick's is located in La Jolla, San Diego, California, for any of those that are watching here that maybe are not familiar with Warwick's. So we've got the two coasts covered, and so hopefully we'll get some viewers in between <laughs> coming in and watching us too. Um, so Warwick's is, like I said, located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. My little sign there says 1896. We're actually celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. So we are not the oldest independent bookstore in the country, but the oldest continuously family owned bookstore in the country. So we've been around for a long time. So, um, and part of that is we have wonderful customers and wonderful people that come in and watch our events and, and buy books from us. So um, I will be putting in Makita's book, Couple Found Slide. Just do any of you have a copy of it? I don't have a copy of it. Do either of you have a copy of the show? There it is. <laughs> Did it just come out on Tuesday? Is that when it came out? Um. Last ago. week, yeah. Last, Last week? week. Okay, yeah. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about. I'm going to put that into the comment section of Facebook so you can easily click there. If you're in the San Diego, La Jolla area, we'd love for you to come into the store. You can click to pick it up at the store if you want, or we can ship it to you. I'd like to say, any way there is to get a book, you can get it from Warwick's or any of your independent bookstores across the country. Um, Sabina and Makita are going to talk for about 35, 30, 35 ish minutes. There'll be a reading and a little video that we'll watch. Um, and then I'll bring in your comments and questions as well after they're done talking. So go ahead and put those into the comment section as well. So I will introduce these two lovely ladies and then we'll turn the show over to them. So Makita Brotman, PhD, is an Oxford-educated scholar and psychoanalyst and the author of several previous books, including An Unexplained Death, The Great Grisby. I had to say, I was looking at that, I was cracking up because I was like, watch me say the wrong title there. <laughs> and the Maximum Security Book Club. She is a professor of humanities at the Maryland Institute of Art in Baltimore. She's here to talk about her latest book, Couple Found Slain, that we just showed you a second ago. With her today is Sabina Heinlein. Sabina is an artist and writer based in New York City. She is the author of the narrative nonfiction books Among Murderers, Life After Prison, and The Orphan Zoo. Her work can be found in German, American, and British publications, among them The New York Times, The Guardian, Psychology Today, and many others. Sabina has received several awards and fellowships and has spoken at New York University, New York Public Library, The New School, University of East and Anglia, and the Maryland Institute College of Art. With that, ladies, have a great conversation, and I'll see you in about a half hour or so. Thank you. Thank you. So shall I just start reading, Sabina? Yeah, yeah sure. OK. So the book is its kind of looks like a true crime book, and it's marketed like a true crime book, but I'm really interested in the parts of the true crime story that don't normally get told, so whether that's um, stories on the periphery, the after effects of crime for the victims, or in this case, um, what happens to the perpetrator after after the after he's been found uh, in this case criminally insane. Because normally we just the, the end of this true crime stories just end with the perpetrator going to trial. Um, you know, there's the police chase and the hunt and the court and the police procedural, but we don't really find out what happens afterwards for the perpetrator and for most young men who are um who commit crimes that's just the beginning of their story so um so i wanted to tell the part of the story that doesn't often get told and for that reason i'm going to read a part of the book that's not the kind of dramatic true crime parts because most of this book is about what happens after the crime when um, brian the young man who is um hospitalized after killing his parents and being found not criminal responsible, is a paranoid schizophrenic, is put in a psychiatric hospital. And 
And first, he's pretty optimistic. He's hoping that, you know, five or six years and he'll be released and he'll be able to restart his life. He had a very abusive um, family relationship. His, his, um, and he was clearly mentally ill for a long time. And what, you know, he committed a horrible crime, but among schizophrenics who commit crimes, which is a very small percent, um, the murder of the parents, parasite is not unusual. It used to be called the, the schizophrenic crime. So anyway, um, most of the book is about Brian's struggle to progress in the hospital, which is very, very difficult for him. In fact, he's still there now. He's been there 27 years. And there's various reasons for that. And the passage I'm going to read is um, a part about language in the hospital and the problems Brian has accommodating all the different changes in vocabulary and what things mean in the hospital and the problems he has kind of negotiating um, the different language system of the hospital and language in, in um, the, the, the different language the patient has from the doctors. So I'll just start, it's not very long. After learning that patients were by law allowed access to their hospital records, Brian had been checking his chart on a regular basis. After the incident with the bathroom supplies, a note was written in his file by one of the nurses describing him as manipulative and intimidating, lacking insight into his past behavior and the serious nature of his illness. Even more frustrating, after complaining to his treatment team that the ward staff were against him, Brian found another note in his chart, this time from Dr. Stolzberg, who's his psychiatrist, describing continued paranoia, hostile speech, suspiciousness, fearfulness, uncooperativeness, and poor problem solving. Although HIPAA allowed patients to have access to their medical notes, most doctors and psychiatrists in particular wrote notes intended for themselves or for other medical professionals rather than the patient who might find their language vague and confusing. At Perkins, phrases like persevering and lacking in insight meant something very specific, although it wasn't always clear to the patients what that was. Estrangement from language is a common feature of paranoid schizophrenia. And in fact, the word schizophrenia means split mind in the sense, not of a mind split in two, but of a splitting between concepts and their associations. And this psychiatric shorthand to a suspicious patient could easily seem like a code designed to trick them. This breach in language is part of the way selfhood and personal identity seem to break down in psychosis. And so in the words of author and schizophrenic Ellen Sachs, the solid center from which one experiences reality can become fuzzy and wobbly at times, breaking up like a bad radio signal or eroding like a sandcastle sliding away in the receding surf. In another first person account, a schizophrenic patient describes his paranoid delusions about language. He says, effectively, I became addicted to thinking about how words could be used to make coded references I became obsessed with playing language games instead of using language primarily as it's normally used. As a result of this, my interpretation of what was really going on became more and more detached from reality and instead was directly derived from interpretations of the language games that I believe people were playing. In this light, it's ironic that ordinary words of Perkins had unpredictable meanings. The word escape, for example, was never used. Instead, it was replaced by elope, to mean exactly the same thing, a word that allegedly minimizes the negative connotation of prison-like behavior, although surely it's not the patient's behavior that's prison-like, but their environment. Essentially, escape is avoided because it suggests forced confinement, whereas an elopement is usually temporary and often for a pleasurable purpose or perhaps accidental, like the wandering of an aged parent with Alzheimer's disease. Words had enormous power at Perkins, it was hardly surprising then that people would fret about them, puzzle over them, pounce on them with feverish enthusiasm. Both doctors and patients would analyze each other's language endlessly and in detail. Doctors wanted to get beneath what they believed to be patients' defensive facades, and patients wanted to gauge what the doctors really thought of them and whether they might be getting any closer to release. Psychiatric terminology in particular would often be picked up and appropriated by non-medical staff including security guards and psychiatric service technicians. Inside the hospital fence, 
language became dehumanizing. Everyday emotions were given clinical names. Unhappiness became anhedonia. Thinking became cognition. Facial expressions were affect. Feelings about other people were transferences. People didn't get to know each other or became, become friends. Their boundaries became confused. In this way, ordinary feelings and experiences were made distant and strange. This kind of language kept patients at arm's length. The same effect was achieved by addressing them, both in person and in their files, as Mr. or Miss, rather than by their first names, as if they didn't share the same emotions as everyone else. Brian had also noticed that doctors got annoyed when patients used the institution's terminology and would accuse the patients of intellectualizing. Discharge was a sacred word, the holy grail toward which everything reached. Support was another. It meant everything and nothing. You could bring it up in any situation. It always fit. Having insight into your illness meant you accepted your psychiatrist's diagnosis. And compliance meant you took your medication without having to be forced. Unsafe was code for suicidal. It was important to be well-adjusted, which meant you complied with your support system. In other words, you followed the rules. Compliance, in fact, was the way out of the hospital. If a patient was compliant enough, they were discharged which didn't necessarily mean their symptoms had gone away, but that they'd learned to repeat the magic words that led the doors to open. Brian knew what he was supposed to say, but either he couldn't say it or he couldn't say it convincingly enough. Because the rules made no sense, he thought, resistance was a healthier response than compliance. In addition to paranoia, he was also accused of setting himself unattainable treatment goals. This was especially depressing for him as his only treatment goal was to one day leave Perkins and support himself in the outside world. Achieving this would be much easier, he thought, if the goalpost didn't keep moving. During his first years at the hospital, everyone had been concerned with how well he understood himself. Now his insight seemed irrelevant. What mattered now was his compliance and taking medication and how much support he had. Those patients lucky enough to get regular visits from friends and family, people on the outside who cared about their well-being, were considered well-supported which rather than self-reliance seemed to be the, the new criteria for release. Like most parents, Brian, through no fault of his own, wasn't so fortunate. Over the last five years, his family, his friends, relatives, and siblings, unable to contact him easily by phone or email, had gradually fallen out of touch. He'd seen it happen to other patients. Perkins is in the middle of nowhere, virtually inaccessible by public transport. Visiting hours are limited and inconvenient. The dress code is strict and it's humiliating for visitors to be searched by security guards. If they have money, patients can use the phone, but only at certain times, and there's only one line for each ward. The family members who'd forgiven Brian for his crime lived far away. Marsha, his sister was in Atlanta, his uncle Walter was in Pittsburgh, and Kathy, another sister who was Brian's main connection on the outside, had recently moved to Ohio. Q, his friend from the karate studio, still called and visited when he could, but he had problems of his own and wasn't always available. Brian's greatest source of support, in fact, was his religion, but he kept that to himself. And I'd like to play a little clip now. I'm just going to share my screen. In uh, 1997, um, a, a film crew from A&E's Investigative Reports was allowed into the hospital. Um, it was a show hosted by Bill Curtis called Untying the Straitjacket, and it was about the insanity defense and what things are like in psychiatric hospitals. And um, Brian was one of the patients that was interviewed. Um, and so this is a clip of him when he was in the hospital in, so this was, he'd been there five years. So this is like 22 years, years ago now, and he's, and he's still there. And actually, you know, at first he seemed like he was doing well. In fact, he's chosen for this, um, for this interview because he's like kind of a model patient and he's following all the rules and taking his medication. Um, compared to all the other patients um, depicted in the documentary, it seems like he's going to be released pretty soon. As it turns out, all the others have been released and Brian is still there. So I'll try um, sharing my screen and hopefully that will work. I thought that somehow people had put a device in the attic where they could send subliminal messages to me and that they had some type of control over me. That's when I bought a gun because I thought 
well, maybe if I buy a gun, they'll leave me alone. And uh, as soon as I bought a gun, things became just so much worse. I, I just became uh, less and less in touch with reality. I just started becoming a loner around that time. And uh, I became real preoccupied with my dogs because I still trusted my dogs that, that you know, that they uh, loved me and cared about me. And uh, I spent a lot of time with them. Like, you know, when I was off work, I'd go to the park with them, just associated with them as if they were people almost. It just got to the point where one day my parents were yelling at me and uh, I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. And uh, next thing I know, I shot my parents. Brian was suffering from delusions. When he committed his crime, he believed that he was in danger and that he had to do what he did in order to prevent something worse from happening. 10 minutes before I killed my parents, I didn't know I was gonna kill my parents. I was really scared because I didn't know uh, whether I'd be in prison for the rest of my life or whether I'd be in here because without the medication, I could become dangerous again. I've been put on some tranquilizers and uh, some medications for depression and medications for schizophrenia. And, uh, you know, I haven't been paranoid since I've been on the medication. I haven't, you know, thought anything that's not real. Patients like Brian may indeed be getting better, but responding to drug treatment marks just the first step down the long road of treatment. Brian Bechtold has never acted out in the five years since he arrived at Perkins after murdering his parents. But because of his extremely violent crime, doctors are still reluctant to give him new degrees of freedom. We are being very, very careful. We are going to slowly give him more freedom. He might go to an open ward. This is a crowded facility. There are a lot of other patients. People get on each other's nerves and he's not allowed to lose his temper. For me, what it's like, I'm in court seven days a week, and constantly being judged. Uh, everything that goes on here, is a judgment. Uh, I want you to just sit relax your hands on your knees and um, open your mouth. Stick your tongue straight out. Move it to the left, and the right. It's very difficult in here. It's very, very strenuous to come across in such a way to present yourself as being sane and to have people question your sanity all the time. So that's my um, little spiel and introduction to the book. It's kind of interesting to see to see Brian there like 22 years ago and um, the problems he's having then in the hospital. I've just got, you know, he's still there 27 years later. Yeah, the, this clip um, seems almost, I mean, there's something almost benign about it um, compared to, you know, when, when I read your book. Um, I. And also, you know, just the section, just alone the section you just read, um, I, I thought um, I particularly like this part because it demonstrates um, the effort of um, the institution to distance itself from the patient. And um, when the goal should really be to form some sort of alliance or, you know, to have empathy for the person and like develop like intimacy um, with the patient. And um, while there's obviously like a lot of problems with, the, or there were a lot of problems with the 19th century um, asylum, um, it was designed more like as a paternal and protective institution. And I was wondering if um, you could talk about like how and why the institution of the 20th and 21st century um, become so did become so filled with hostility and um, divisiveness and illogicality. I mean, as it is described in that um, in that part about speech, where like everything is just you know used to distance yourself from the patient. I think it's because 
I mean, I think actually it would be better to call somewhere like Perkins an asylum because it's not really a hospital. I mean, a hospital is a place where you go, where everyone wants you to get better and to, to, for you to get out of there as soon as possible. And it's a place where you know, people go for short stays to cure an injury. And, and Perkins is much more like an asylum and there isn't the kind of hustle and bustle of a hospital. And in fact, when people get really sick, they have to be sent out, out to a, a real hospital. So, but um, there isn't really anything between hospital and prison. And the reason for the distance, I think, is because it's because mental illness is seen as a subset of physical illness and that a psychiatrist is a, sub, a subset of, of doctor. And so that this is all, you know, the language that's used is the language of science and medicine. And on the one hand, it's really important to take, you know, mental illness as seriously as physical illness and get the same kind of treatment and, you know, insurance um, reimbursement and that kind of thing. But on the other hand, Mental illness is not just a subset of physical illness. It involves, I mean, most mental illnesses are to do with things like spirituality and existentialism and what it means to live in a human body and to have a human mind. And um, all of those, those kinds of human elements are all taken out of the discourse of science, which is what, what's used, and diagnosis, which is what's used in the hospital today. And everything has to be like um has to be demonstrable the results have to be scientifically demonstrable and so everything's to do with charts and graphs and di dsm diagnoses and certain medications that are used for certain illnesses and there's none of that all that discourse about relationships and um you know that this being like more of a kind of spiritual or emotional or human dilemma, there's no room for that anymore because I think because it's that language, that kind of moral language is devalued and the language of science and medicine is seen as, you know, the, the, the kind of reigning supreme language because it's yeah. it can be kind of factually backed up whereas everything else is just wishy-washy, you know. Right, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, so... The one time I met Brian and when you took me with you to um, visit him, he struck me as very intelligent and very sensitive and also very attuned to whomever he speaks to. And I've written extensively about people who have killed and people with mental illness. Um, and Brian did not strike me as narcissistic or psychopathic, um, yet he obviously has been institutionalized and um, severely punished for much longer than other people you and I have met. So I was wondering, you know, as I was reading the book, and I mean, uh, th there are a lot of things that um, shed light um, on this in the book, but maybe you can talk about um, what it is about Brian in particular that has made it so impossible for him to be released. I think for, um, the main thing is that he, I mean, he, when you, when I, the clip, when I showed you the clip, he was still doing well there and he was still following the rules and it seemed like he was getting closer to release. But I'd say that there were, there, there are three things that have worked against him pretty um, catastrophically. One is he's always been reluctant to take medication. And at first it was his own choice. You could choose. I mean, you didn't have to take medication at first, but he came to realize that, you okay, you didn't have to take medication, but that means you're not compliant. And compliance is one of the things that go into your file that leads to your eventual release. And he'd seen people who took medication and it make this medication would make him incontinent and impotent. And and he, it did, you know, eventually he had to take it and it did. And he just didn't want to be one of those guys slumped in front of the television all day. Um, so, so his, you know, his reluctance to take medication, conflicts about medication are the first thing that's been held against him for so long, I think. Um, the second is that he's kind of maintained a sense of dignity. And that means that he's acted, what's called acted out, which means that he's tried to escape. He's had periods where he's been aggressive. He attacked a social worker. When he tried to escape, he was shot by the police. 
Now he was actually doing it because he would rather be in prison or be killed. You know, it's kind of an attempted suicide by cop. And yet all of that was seen as a symptom of his pathology instead of the way I see it is a rational um, response to being in that situation an attempt to, to make some kind of change, however drastic, even if it meant being shot by the police and killed, even if it meant being sent to prison, he felt it would be better than being at the hospital. And that's really distressing. Uh, I think, I, I believe that he was um, acting pretty rationally, but all of that scene is held against him for, for a long time. And the third thing is that his, he, he has no last, he has no remaining contacts with his family. So his, obviously his parents are dead. He's, uh, one of his sisters is dead. Um, he had one, he has one remaining sister who's, uh, who, who is willing to take him if he's ever released, but she lives in Ohio, so she can't visit. Um, he's been there 27 years. So his community contacts are mostly passed away, moved on, um, have forgotten him. So that, so again, that's another really important criteria for release is like your support system in the community. It's no fault of Brian's that he doesn't have a support system, but that's also held against him. Like there's nowhere for him. There's no one to, you know, he, he can't be released temporarily and they can see how he does and then spend a little more time outside the hospital. It's, um, so none of these are his faults, I think, but they're all held against him. Mm -hmm. And so you have known Brian for um, many years, obviously. And I was wondering, you know, as a prolific writer, at what point um, did you decide to write a book about Brian? Not for a while. I mean, I was, when I met him, I was, um, I was in the middle of a, a book about my dog. <laughs> and then I wrote a book about the man I was working in the prison. And I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to write a book about Brian, but like I'm always on the lookout, you know, for really interesting stories and for people who would make whose stories are interesting. And I was just fascinated by, like he's been through so many things and people will often think that if you've spent 27 years in a psychiatric hospital, nothing really happens to you. And on a sort of day-to-day -day level, that's true. It's like really boring bureaucratic procedural um, life. But on a larger scale, like there's been, patient on patient murders there's been a psychiatrist who was criminally insane that you know he's tried to escape and he'd been shot he he's got cancer <laughs> he recovered from cancer he's been to court to defend himself like his own life has had all these incredible ups and downs and and so I wanted to tell it because it's just not not just as interesting its own right but you never hear that kind of behind the behind the scenes story and so it was after um, I stopped volunteering there that I started to like talk to him more on the phone and visit him as a visitor. And then, and then with COVID, they introduced Skype visits. So it was a bit more convenient uh, and they're still doing that now. So, and then he gave me access to all his medical records and I got, it was a long time, you know, investigating all this, I got, all the police <coughs> files and talk to his <coughs> sister, interviewed other people that know him. So, um, and the more I, the more information I got, the more I realized, even though it's, his story is not typical, I think it still sheds a lot of light on the psychiatric system and, and the difficulties there. I think his is an extreme case, but I'm sure there's plenty of other people going through similar situations. Well, also, I mean, it's a it's a very dense book with a lot of information, and it takes a long time. I feel like, you know, as a writer, it takes a long time to process um, these things and to sort of make sense out of them how you want to um, portray or like how you want to structure the, the narrative. Um, so, um, reading the book, like. I want to say that the premise is to make the reader aware of what happens in the institution's underbelly, um, yet you're not exactly um, like the, the typical advocacy writer. And knowing you personally, I know there's um, something else at stake, um, something that's like more, you know, personal, and more intimate. And um, I, I'm wondering like what attracts you to these dark stories? And then also how do you cope with the injustice um, and sadness of the subject matter? Um, 
I think in in one of the things that really struck me about Brian's case is that this it really seemed like that could be any of us that he, he if we're going to say that a person is not responsible for a crime and we're saying that they're ill they committed it when they were out of their mind then that really could be that really could happen to any one of us and brian's reacting to a very abusive family situation and i feel i feel as though um you know i'm very lucky in my life but that really could have been me or and and i feel like we we tend to identify with the with the kind of um identified victims of of true crime stories rather than the perpetrator and it's always this binary of like victim or perpetrator doctor or patient good or evil and and i think it's much more nuanced and complicated than that and i think that the um victim and perpetrator are, are often the same person just at different points in their lives like Brian was a victim, now he's a perpetrator. Most perpetrators were victims at some point too. And um, and that's like to me much more interesting than the black and white way that most kind of most true crime stories uh, approach the world. So um it is it is depressing. And like I'm not I'm not really interested in advocacy or you know talking about like institutional change or anything that can be done but like i am interested in brian and his story and so um all i'm trying to do is tell his story and if reading his story makes people think maybe more in a more nuanced way about crime um then that you know that's more than i can hope for uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so it's making things like it is depressing but it's also like um kind of a affirming that we're not alone in this right yeah um so when you say that in the book also that um you know white well people who suffer from schizophrenia are far more likely to become victims of violent crime than perpetrators um you mentioned that if they do become violent um it is not uncommon that this violence is directed towards their parents and um you know, this is interesting to me um, not only because people who commit crimes in the midst of a delusional breakdown often don't remember the act itself. Um, so there's something happening more or less subconsciously that makes someone with schizophrenia choose his or her parent. And if I remember correctly, Brian also didn't remember the act itself. And, um, you know, I once wrote a little blog post about um, someone who had killed his mother um, in a delusional breakdown, and he also didn't remember the act itself, um, but remembered what happened like right before and right after the killing. And as a um, psychoanalyst, as a reporter, why do you think Brian killed his parents as opposed to some other person close to him or just a random person on the street, if it is such a um, you know, an, an act that he doesn't actually remember right afterwards. Well, I think, you know, m many schizophrenics who, when they do kill their parents, um, they almost never kill again. And that's because the object of their anxiety is, is dead. It's not, it's not like this random act of like a mass shooting or something. It's not kind of a reaching out against society. It's those specific people even if they are the, doing something unconsciously with no memory of it. I mean, I really think from my sense of the family history is that Brian was enacting something that, enacting the desires of all the siblings that had been repressed or unconscious. And um, and he was, you know, in some in families often one sibling will be the, the kind of enactor of the unconscious desires of the other siblings and also sometimes of the parents. I mean, I feel it's not going too far to say that the, the parents kind of created the vehicle of their own destruction by, I mean, having this kid who was unwanted, who was born much later than his other siblings, who was sort of neglected and overlooked. It's almost like they were kind of unconsciously bringing about their own downfall by failing to pay attention to what was going on under their noses. I mean, he was walking around with a shotgun in the house, like taking the shotgun into the shower with him. And his parents saw this as he's got this obsession with attack from outsiders. 
instead of thinking like, you know, <laughs> could that be us? You know, just thinking that he he has has got these delusions of um, and paranoia, but not seeing themselves as the possible objects of that paranoia. So obviously no way they're to blame, but there's some kind of like complicated dynamic going on involving all the family members, I think, and the kind of accumulated history of mental illness, not just in the immediate family, but in previous generations as well. And, and what about the remembering part? I mean, that, you know, he remembers right before and right afterwards. Is it yeah. the, the trauma of killing that, that makes people sort of black out or? That w from what I've read, it's, I mean, it's not exactly that he um, didn't remember it, but it has a quality of unreality. Like he wasn't sure if it actually happened or if it was something he saw on TV or he dreamed or he fantasized or that he imagined. And in fact, at the time, he thought he felt his feet went on the ground. So it was an act that he did commit, but it was so like distant from the other kind of other daily reality. It was such a delusion that he um, he couldn't think of it in the same way that he thought of like walking his dogs. It wasn't part of his ordinary daily reality. It was something on another plane that was so um, removed from ordinary life that he wasn't actually sure if it if it happened. So he did have a memory of it, but it was a memory of him being like an automaton or going through the motions. And, you know, just like if you're in a car accident, everything kind of slows down and you start to, things take on a completely sort of otherworldly dimension. I think it's, it's kind of like that. Well, it's also such a hard thing to imagine. I mean, I, I would imagine if you've gone through that act that you can, it's like afterwards, you might have some sort of weird memory of it. You don't know if it's true or not, because you just, it's hard to imagine you having done that because you're not naturally maybe a violent person. So. Right, right. And in fact, I, you know, I include a, almost verbatim the interview with the police when he confesses because mm -hmm. they don't believe him. And they keep saying, are you sure you did this? Are you sure your parents aren't just at their vacation home? And um, are you sure, you know, they seem to think he was on drugs. And he he didn't want to get close to discussing, like when they suggested that maybe you didn't actually do this, he kind of wanted to believe that, but didn't at the same time. And it became very terrifying to even think about it and talk about it. And I imagine that, you know, when someone does something that's, and, act of such desperation and so violent is it must be very difficult you know it's, it's surrounded by trauma and it's really hard to kind of relive it and remember that that was actually you doing that thing mm -hmm. right right the hard to relive it that's true um so more than anything else i've read by you this book is clearly um a collaboration between um you and your subject and you gave brian a lot of agency which i loved um um, I was wondering, was it like this from the start or how did this collaboration unfold? And were you always sure that Brian was a reliable narrator or were there points where you were in doubt of his narrative? Um, he, uh, he well, there, there were, I, I never doubted him because I kind of trusted what he that it didn't, like when there were things that were unflattering to him, he was very honest about them and very, um, straightforward and he also gave me access to all his medical records and so and I also talked to interviewed people who knew him like his sister and his friends and who collaborated who, who kind of backed and corroborated what I was um, saying and what Brian was saying but I wanted to include a lot of um, like the transcripts of him representing himself in court for example to show that like oh, it's not just me that's impressed and finds him articulate like he really is articulate and judge for yourself, you know, read this, read the words that he spoke in court and when he was representing himself. And I, um, and included a lot of notes from his doctors and so on to show, you know, it's not, it's, I'm not taking Brian's word for it. I'm, I have the records and I'm quoting verbatim from his doctor's reports. So um, once you know, when I, once I had it, all that access to all that information, it, it became clear that I could trust him. But also, um, I wanted him to tell his story. So I'm the like mouthpiece, but I try and make it clear that 
you know, Brian felt this, Brian believed this, Brian said this. I'm not 100% verifying the factuality of it. Like when Brian believed that the staff were against him, perhaps they were, perhaps it was his, his own experience, but I'm trying to portray his point of view and help the reader get inside his head and to know what it feels like to be in that situation and to explain that his reactions I think are natural and he's not a not mental illness and not a, a, a symptom of pathology and to feel that this is kind of a rational way to act and that we might feel that way in the same situation but at the same time not to like 100% guarantee the factuality of it all because it's mostly about feelings and experiences and not facts anyway so I, I i'm really trying to get away from that you know from the medical scientific language anyway and to tell his story mm -hmm. him tell his story through his voice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so couple found slain focuses very little on the crime itself and brian turned himself in so the whodunit element of um traditional true crime is, is missing. And Brian's struggle to free himself from the institution and his daily life seems in many ways like much more chilling um, than the crime itself. Um, um, so with hit series like um, Criminal and Root of Evil and Trial by Media and Generation Hustle, um, true crime certainly has had its revolutionary moments in recent years. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you would say um, distinguishes your book from other recent um, true crime hits um, and what did you want to do differently? Well, um, actually, let me just get, before I answer that question, let me just go back to the previous question because I wanted to say that oh, sorry. Brian, Brian actually doesn't, um, he didn't really like the finished book. I'd given him pre like previous versions because it took a, a, there were a lot of drafts and a lot of rewrites and he liked earlier versions much more. And he doesn't really like this one as much as he liked earlier versions because this one, he feels like he doesn't want to focus on the crime and he doesn't want, he didn't like the title and he doesn't want that to be such a significant part of it, but he understood that it had to be. and. I don't want to, you know, to skirt over the crime. I want to make it really clear that that's what he's in there for and that he did commit this horrible crime and um, and that's what people will, you know, remember about him and, and is always at the forefront of the doctor's minds. So it's not really um, the way that he would have told the story, but it's also, I think it's important to, to structure it like that. Um, I... I guess the difference with, I, I like this, this, some true crime I, I like most, but I don't like the kind of narrativizing and editorializing and commentary. And I really like the having the, the, like the facts for myself, the transcripts or the audio files or the police file, like having all the information and then making my own decision. And I don't like the way that like some, narrator or editor or showrunner decides this is what's important and if you structure it this way if you omit this and add this then it's going to like create a narrative arc for the for the audience to follow like that's probably what goes into making a hit but it doesn't really interest me and right. I'm more interested in like the behind the scenes stuff even if it most people might find it kind of banal or tedious I'm not interested in making it into an appealing story for the audience. Like it already is an appealing story for me and I don't want anything done to it. So if it were up to me, I think I would just like have pure transcripts or, you know, that that those themselves are full of such fascinating moments. But I like the fact that I'd like as much kind of primary information as possible because that allows the reader or audience to, to think about these things and to make up their own mind or not. Like, I think there isn't really closure and it's kind of a big chaotic mess in the end. And um, and what, so I guess I, I feel like most true crime in writing, whether it's fiction or, or, um, or novels or television programs is, is just too neat, you know, and it doesn't really include that messiness where there isn't 
a, a happy conclusion or a neat conclusion or any conclusion at all. You know, Brian's still in the hospital. There's no, there's no um, real ending. Mm -hmm. story. Yeah, it, it is very frustrating um, to see, you know, how, how neatly packaged a lot of the newer or like in general true crime is, but even the newer one and like how it all um, thrives to have this like certain narrative arch, um, arc. I agree with that. Do you have okay. anything to recommend? Um, well, have, have you listened to um, Root of Evil, the podcast about no. the... There, there's two podcasts out right now about the Black Dahlia killing. And that is, I think, the good one. Like it's um, done by some, um, by two girls who think um, they, their grandfather was the murderer who uh, follows sort of the family history. I, I think that you would interest that. Um, we'd be interested in that, I think. Yeah, well, we really enjoyed um, Generation Hustle, but it's also very, um, also neatly packaged, but just like a sort of brainless evening TV show, um, you know, that's sort of entertaining. And yeah. yeah, I think that's a hard part is that for the TV and the podcast things, they kind of have to have that neat sort of where the in books you can get into the more complicated because it is. This is, a, this is there. You're so right. There's no right answer to any of this, and no. Mm -hmm simple solution um yeah but I, I mean i like thinking about the the mess of it and i don't i mean maybe i'm alone in this but or, but i don't want someone else kind of deciding what's important and telling the story is brian i mean the he'll just be there forever at this point is that well i don't know i mean i hope not um I'm hoping, I mean, he comes up, you know, every so often he can have, go to court and have a release hearing. And he, um, if he, if he can, get, if he can get a, an attorney and a private psychiatrist, he might send some chance of release. But um, so far, like, he doesn't seem any closer to release now than any, any um, time since I've known him in 2013. He certainly doesn't seem mentally ill either. And if he was, if, 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 I mean, this is a, I'm sorry, I'm a complete novice on this. So uh, excuse me on the question if it's completely out. But if it, if he was tried for, for in a criminal court for, and not found mentally ill, would his sentence have been as long as he's been in the mental hospital? So his far? attorney told me he would have got, he would have got life without parole. So, uh, so he would be there for life, which, okay. I mean, he says, that would be fine. Like a determinate sentence would be better than this constant torture of hope. But, you know, let's say he does get released. He, he's 55. He might have, you know, he still might have years to live where he would have a chance to, to have a productive life. Who knows? Okay, there is a question um, as we kind of come into a closing here. So a um, question from Facebook is from Amanda. You've written on such a wide array of subjects, offensive movies, the solitary nature of reading, even exceptional dogs. <laughs> For someone um, who is obviously curious about many things, how do you settle on your next project? And also what will your next book be if it's in the works? Well, I've actually, I've actually been trying to write some fiction and I've finished a manuscript and I, I, I wanted to write something that like would sell and be popular. And I felt like I'd written something really kind of palatable, but still people tell me it's too dark <laughs> and I have to like, get it like that, that it's too dark for popular taste. So I'm trying to write a novel that's, um, that, and trying to make it um, appealing to a, a wide audience, but apparently, I, I don't really know what that is because. <laughs> I think well, pretty... coming from somebody that likes the dark subjects, yeah. you've got one reader right here. <laughs> yeah. That's what everyone tells me. <laughs> yeah, but we'll see. Yeah, so there's not to. another nod. So you've got the fiction going, but nothing nonfiction that you're. No, not yet. No. About. no. Well, I'm curious about a lot of things, but nothing. Nothing that I'm writing about at the moment. Amanda says here, it's pretty funny. She goes, um, don't listen to them. People love the dark stuff. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so as we get into closing, this was an absolutely fascinating conversation. Sabina, thank you so much for conducting this thank conversation. Um, is there any place that you would like to direct viewers that are watching this that maybe want to find out a little bit about, more about you and what you do? Is there a website or something we can direct people to? Me? Yes. Oh, no, Mikita, right? No, Sabine, you. Oh, you. Oh. And then I'll ask Mikita. Oh, I, I've um, not really been doing much writing lately. Um, so... I mean, people can go to, I have two websites. One is sabinaheinlein.org, um, which is my writing website. And the other one is animalquilter.com, which is my um, art website. So. Love it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then Makita, for you, where would you like to direct people? Do you have a website that people can go to? Yeah, I'm just admiring those bats behind Sabina. There's one of your quilts. I know, I was just going to say, there's, oh, it's, it's got a yeah. bat. Oh, it's yeah. so cool. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just my name, NikitaBrockman.com, and all my everything's there. Okay. Well, ladies, thank you so much for um, bringing this conversation to us, and Makita for bringing this book to us. It's a fascinating story, and and you're so right. It's the true crime always. The other side of it is a very interesting part of the perpetrator part of it is extremely interesting, and and where this all leads is very um, fascinating. So, thank you. Thanks thank you. Having. All right. Okay. So when I close this, we're going to close out. So good night, everybody. And thank you again. Good night. Thank you. Good night.